For many of us, the holiday has been a mixed bag of emotion. Of course, we appreciate receiving and giving gifts, of course. We feasted with family and friends around large tables filled with old family recipes and special new dishes. However, the season has been also for many of us a cruel reminder of old family quarrels and a source of incredible stress. To quote the famous beginning of Charles Dickens' a Tale of Two Cities, it was the best of time, it was the worst of time. It was the age of wisdom, it was the age of foolishness, it was the epoch of belief, it was an epoch of incredibility, it was the season of light, it was the season of darkness, it was the spring of hope, it was the winter of despair. This is somehow the feeling we can experience when we read today's text from the Gospel according to Matthew. This beautiful and beloved story featuring seeker coming from the east bearing extravagant gifts to a child born in a manger. And the image of these men kneeling in front of the Christ child has been an inspiring symbol of worship for countless generations. However, it also features character driven by fear, deception, and violence. According to the author Joni Sacken, this simple story has the ability to show how the best and the worst of human nature spring forth in the response of God's gift of revelation. In fact, in just a few sentences, the whole discrepancy and complexity of humanity is fully revealed. So our story begins with a group of strangers, and the, the text does not tell us their number, how many they were, or, or their names. That's tradition. A group of strangers, I said, who crash into Jesus' birth narrative. Those uninvited foreigners, most likely high-ranking uh, political and religious advisor to the rulers of empires that we would situate most likely today in Iran and Iraq. Those men arrive in Jerusalem without any warning. And these men, with a different wisdom, a different culture, a different religious background, began to ask where they could find a child who has been born king of the Jew. They wanted to pay homage, not to the actual king, who, the one who is established and recognized by all, but the one they believe and they considered to be the real king of the Jews. And if we have grown comfortable with this ancient biblical story, I wonder what would happen if the same took place here and now. Would we be amazed by the determination and the faith of these men? Or would we be concerned about their sudden presence in our community? And honestly, very honestly, would, how would we react if foreigners from countries we seem to fear the most these days show up to, and challenge our, I don't know, established order or way of life? How would we react if people from a different culture, a religion or origin, come to tell us who should rule our country. I don't know. I don't know in this day and age of polarizing politics, too many political parties across the Western world, 
use emigration and the fear of the unknown as wedge issues to gain supporters. They claim, and the most radical especially claim, that we should begin to take care of our own, meaning the people who look, speak, worship, and behave exactly like us before opening doors to strangers. They say before questioning our laws, breaking our tradition, and throwing everything upside down, those foreigners should start settling down, learning our ways, assimilating our values, find a good paying job. They claim that after a few years, maybe those people could have an opinion who, who is the real authority in our society. Maybe. That's one part of the story. We also find in the story the King Herod the Great. And historians tell us that he was a deeply paranoid man. A man who murdered his own sons, one of his wives, and countless political rivals to his throne just to remain in position. So imagine how thrilled he must have been when a band of wise men from the east show up in town with their camel loaded with gifts that were usually, usually given to person of a high status looking for the new king of the Jews. Of course he felt threatened. So he immediately called his best advisor and devise a plan to ensure his political survival. And Herod secretly called the wise man and made this deceptive request. Oh, go and search diligently for the child, he says. And when you have found him, bring me word so I can also go and pay him homage. Yeah, sure. <laughs> the wise men saw through Herod's lie. And when he understood that he has been tricked, the king ordered the death of all children in and around Bethlehem who were two years old or under. To keep his power and privileges, Herod used all the means at his disposal even the most violent and cruel ones. Of course, none of us has gone as far as Herod. And yet, at one point or another in our lives, fear has dictated our first response to something new. Even something potentially great and promising, because too many of us value the status quo peace and order and the protection of our way of life. Oh, we're not against uh, protecting minority, acknowledging the rights of the First Nation, fighting climate changes, or eradicating poverty all around the world. No, no, no. But, but as long as it costs me nothing, but as long as my way of life don't change by a yoda, but as long as I can enjoy the same privileged position in society I always had. Even if we have the means and the resources to stop poverty, exploitation, famine in our world, we prefer convincing ourselves that we live in a brutal and cruel world and we can do nothing about it. And in the middle of all of this, we have a baby. The sparks that ignite all the chaos back then was the birth of the long-awaited Messiah. And interestingly, in Matthew's Gospel, the Messiah did not come as a conquering hero who saved every human being and ended all wars and conflicts. In fact, his arrival changed almost nothing. The world has not been immediately transformed. 
brutality and cruelty were still a com- common reality after Jesus, right after Jesus' birth as it was just before. And 2,000 years later, we ought to admit that violence still can be seen all around us. Despite valuable peace initiatives and effort, every nation is not holding hands and saying kumbaya together. Oh, we are very generous with our resources and our money, but too many children are still dying due to illnesses, famine, or wars. We still live in a perplexing world in which the best and the worst of humanity coexist. So my friends, what should we take from this ancient story? Where is God? Where is the good news for us today? Well, maybe it is found in the decision of the wise men to go back home by another road. This small details in the narrative has a huge repercussion in the unfolding of the rest of the story. Because beyond saving the life of Jesus, Mary, and Joseph, of course, these men, considered to be a dangerous stranger according to the authorities, these men made the choice to follow a different path. They decided to turn their back to all the lies, the deception, the petty games of powers surrounding them. When everyone seems to go low and follow their lowest instinct, they prefer remaining on the higher ground. Despite of potential repercussion for themselves, the wise men took a risk in order to protect what was beautiful and holy in this world. And the same opportunity is offered to all of us today. Yes, violence and brutality can be found everywhere. Just turn on your TV around 6 o'clock just to see the extent of it. Yes, too many of our rulers have often lied to us and would do almost everything to keep their position. And yes, it always seems easier to achieve our goal by cheating and lying and taking shortcuts. However, all of this does not mean that we ought to play by those rules. We can always choose to reject a system that reward those who are watching their neighbors and betraying their brothers and sisters. We can refuse to be afraid of what we do not not know. We can believe that a better society is possible. We can answer the call to actively work for justice and dignity for everyone without exception. Every day we had the opportunity to refuse darkness and walk in the inbreaking light of God. Every day we can arise and reflect this light everywhere we go. Every day we can be a beacon of light, a beacon of hope, a beacon of transformation in our world. And most often, it simply begins by embodying this way of life despite all the indication pointing in another direction. We can dare to believe the truth when we are surrounded by light. We can have the courage to speak about peace and reconciliation when we see violence and conflicts all around us. We can choose wisdom over fullness. We can choose light over darkness. We can choose to believe that there's more than enough light and goodness in this world for everyone. Another quote that I particularly like is, maybe we're afraid of strangers so much because we we know ourselves too well. 
as it often does, the old stories of our Bible anticipate our worst impulses and provide alternative scripts to live a different way. The wise men are a role model for us, not because they bought expensive gifts for the Christ child, but because they decided to go beyond human impulses and live by the principle Jesus came to teach us. They remind us of the importance as we begin the season of epiphany to always choose light over darkness. Thanks be to God and amen.